All right, I want to thank you all for joining us today. My name is Casey Atkins. I'm one of the new NCITE directors, and I'm pleased to um, introduce our speakers today. Today we have Doug Carter. Doug is the state geometric engineer in OPMTS and has 24 years of experience in road design and has worked for the state of Minnesota for 11 years. His private sector experience and technical background includes geotechnical and dam engineering, Superfund site assessment, and lead accredited water resource design. Doug graduated from Seattle University with a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and a minor in chemistry. Doug races cycle cross with his two children in his spare time. In addition to Doug, we have Jamal Love. Jamal has worked in the geometric design support unit in OPMTS for 10 years. During the preceding 11 years, he worked in MnDOT maintenance, design, construction, surveys, and design build. Jamal and his wife are avid cyclists, backpackers, and cross-country skiers, and they are currently waiting for city approval to move into their tiny home community. So with that, I will hand over the, um, the reins to Jamal to share his screen, and we'll get going. Thank you all. I will actually. It was. It's funny. I don't know if any if any of the people that are here were in that picture that you just saw on the screen. The um, it was, it was kind of a funny, a funny thing. We were in a training class, and like most training classes, it's early in the morning. It's on the first day. No one knows anyone. We're all. They all look sleepy, and they don't want to talk. And so. I, I pointed out to them that that was the case, that they all looked very tired. So I said, well, let's do a little bit of exercise so that we can, um, you know, kind of wake up a little bit before we start. So I told them all, raise your right hand over your head. And I said, okay, wave that arm from side to side. I turned around and raised my camera up and held it up and said, now smile. And I took that picture. And so it was kind of a, a nice way to, to break the ice. And I've always liked that picture since then for, for that reason. Um, so Doug and I are here today. We, we appreciate the opportunity to come in and speak with you guys, and we're uh, grateful to Casey for in inviting us inviting us to speak. I think the, the way that this um, started was that we, we were working with, on a project with someone who's involved with Insight, and we were discussing roundabout capacity in that meeting and they said boy that doesn't seem to be common knowledge would you consider coming and presenting on that topic and so that's what that's what kind of started it was that we agreed for that reason and then then casey was was good enough to come in um, and help come up with other topics so that we can you know fill the time um i do have a question though how many people are here we have 98 signed on right now is, is that is that common because it seemed like an awful lot of people um my understanding is it's um a lot more than we typically have at a meeting um especially virtual so it's really exciting there's a lot of interest all right well and well try to so make do sure you don't you don't make any mistakes jamal <laughs> yeah but well i get i guess even with a with a large group we would invite participation if there's something you'd like to talk about or or information you would like you you know we're certainly we're certainly open to that if you if you get carried away i'm sure casey will stop you so <clears throat> this this was the um, an email that we got from Casey and so just kind of briefly the types of topics that we're going to try, try and cover today. So capacity obviously was our primary reason for for coming and speaking with you today. We have a few other other topics that were on the list. So talking about many roundabouts, approach striping and signing and in those those two in particular, I think if you had, you know, specific things that you were interested in about those, we could we could kind of veer off and, and talk about talk about those things. We will play this video um, about the the uh, vehicle considerations and and the back end diagonal parking, and then we threw together a bit of a do's and don'ts, but not extensively. So that's that's another topic that we that we could speak about. Uh, is that? Can you hear a phone ringing? Yeah, I'll work on on getting people oh. muted here. If you could oh. all please mute, otherwise I will work my way through the list and get folks muted. Thank you. OK, so just just starting out, this is kind of an overview of uh, project management and technical support, which is the office that that we're a part of. And so Tom Strabicki is the state design engineer. 
And so our office manager then is Nancy Yu. And within her office, we have design standards, which used to be Mike Ely's group, but he retired. Design flexibility with Jim Rosenau, site development, which is like rest areas and historic things with Rob Williams, value engineering with Minnie, and then Doug, who's here with me today, is in charge of geometrics. And then the staff of our group would be Gwen May is the assistant geometrics engineer, and she manages Matt Schleisner, and we have a grad that started today, I think, even though I haven't met him, uh, Alejandro Mendoza. And then I manage um, more of the review technical side and that and then my reports are Josh Fleck and Brian Whiffler. So that's the extent of our group and people that you you know may have worked with in the past. <clears throat> so our, our first topic is roundabout capacity. And so you know we were just thinking back in time when early on in the process what we did is we treated roundabouts like we treat all all projects. And so we looked at our design year 20 years into the future we attempted to meet the capacity of that design with the information that we had at the time and we and we built roundabouts and much more often than now we built multi-lane roundabouts and that was something that was pretty common nationally was that roundabouts were being built to projections with more capacity than they necessarily needed at opening day and so what i have on the screen now is a list of of roundabouts that we had built in actually this first one belongs to Washington County, but it's it's just a, an example that tends to be well known of roundabouts that were built and opened with multiple lanes and that you know experienced functional problems over time. And then we had to revisit them and come up with a way to deal with that. So we didn't take part directly in in this in this Washington County one, but you can see that the through capacity on this roadway was removed you know, based on some accident trouble that they had had. This one is uh, Zachary Lane at 610. And this is one that was actually designed and built during design build and didn't come through the normal review that it would. But we had problems in this quadrant with vehicles in the outside lane turning, vehicles in the inside lane not turning. And so we we went, we looked at the accident patterns we're having and made some adjustment to it to try and deal with that. And for the most part have been successful. This third one is Broadway in 61. And you can see by the striping that capacity was removed in multiple directions. And what we've what we've had is, you know, we had accident trouble, we traded off delay in exchange for that accident trouble. And, and these were some of the ways that it was handled. This bottom picture is Kings Point Road, and it is a two lane um, undivided highway. And then when you come to the roundabout, it opens up into an unbalanced two plus one roundabout, and then tapers right back to one lane in each direction. And this one, I think the ADT out on this road is around 15,000 on Highway 7 here. and we have a, a fair amount of traffic, specifically peak hour traffic in this roundabout, but the crashes have been high enough here that the plan is actually to stripe away the second through lane and make this a single lane roundabout again, even though you know, the numbers that we see in the peak hour would, would tend to call for a multi-lane roundabout. You know, the performance is causing us to accept more delay in exchange for avoiding some of those crashes. In 2017, our um, traffic engineering office did a report on roundabout crashes. And actually, we're kind of coming to a point now where, where we'll see a repeat of this, of this study. But what you see on the screen now is a comparison of crashes in different types of roundabouts. And what they did is they looked at the sites before the roundabouts were installed, and then they made a comparison to those same sites after the roundabouts were installed. And so system wide, what they found was that we actually saw a decrease in total crashes and, you know, in large decreases in all, in all types of injury crashes, but a, a decrease in total crashes in single lane roundabouts. In unbalanced roundabouts, like two plus ones, for example, we saw an increase in crashes of almost 44%. You know, system wide, that's what we see. You know, it, you might find a specific case where crashes don't seem to go up, but then we balance that out with with locations where crashes are way up. And in the aggregate, we find that 
we have more crashes in two plus ones than we would have in the existing condition. And in multi lanes, actually, we have you know a pretty significant crash increase. So resulting from this study, MnDOT management then came to us and said, we want to handle roundabouts differently. And so they they gathered a committee and they and they thought it through. And a few things came out of that out of that time period. The first thing was a direction to resist additional capacity and roundabouts to the greatest extent practical and reasonable. And so, you know, management actually told us to intentionally reduce the number of lanes that we're seeing in our roundabouts because they did not want to continue seeing the crash patterns and they didn't want to continue seeing the the tendency of us to go out and have to do something to mitigate crashes in our roundabouts. We're looking to expand their use and we don't we don't want them to function poorly. So that was one part of it. And the other part of it was that they said stop designing for 20 years. And what they concluded, you know, based on negotiations was that they they said, OK, start predicting 10 years and use that as your design year to further reduce the amount of capacity that we're seeing in our roundabouts. <clears throat> so because of that type of thinking, we then started to take a little bit of a different approach. And so this is a, a roundabout down on Highway 3 in, in Farmington, and it was designed in, in 07, built in 08, and it was built single lane with the intention that it be expanded to multi-lane. And the predicted year for multi-lane was you know, it was roughly 10 years. I think it was actually less than that, but it, it, it was about 10 years that they were saying we're going to need additional capacity. And in that time period, we would have said as a rule of thumb that roughly 1000 vehicles in conflict in any one quadrant would be cause for additional capacity. So, if you know, if you do the math and add these up, you'll find that we're at 1105 down in this southeast quadrant in this roundabout. The picture on the left is the current picture of that roundabout. So not only did it not get it expanded in 10 years, we have no intentions like there's no. There's nothing that would trigger us to do anything here the way it's functioning. And another part of it is that the increase in traffic that was predicted just simply hasn't happened, you know, so we haven't seen all of the traffic that we were predicting and even with the increases that we've had, which 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 are exceeding a thousand vehicles in conflict, that's not enough to to cause us to want to expand capacity here. So this then leads us to you know kind of a natural question. If we look at roundabouts and we say the rule of thumb values for the amount of conflicting traffic that we have. You know, our experience is saying that they can handle that and that, you know, they still seem to function OK. And, and our experience is also saying that if we provide additional capacity, maybe whether it's unnecessary or sometimes maybe even necessary, what we're seeing is a level of crashes that we don't always want to tolerate. And that's consistent with what the nation was seeing. You know, there's kind of a general feeling that roundabouts were overbuilt, which is why roundabouts are so rarely expanded. And this puts us into kind of an interesting place because we don't really have a way to say what's the right amount of delay for a roundabout. So when we look at our own our own delay and we say at a signalized intersection, here's the delay that we would expect and how we would rate level of service based on that or at an always stop at an uncontrolled intersection. Here's what we would expect for delay and how it would be perceived by drivers and that leaves us with the question of which what's the right amount of delay for a roundabout and how do we decide what that is and so we went to fhwa and we posed that question is anyone looking at this is any research being done has anyone come up with a way to quantify this to say here's how much delay we should be having because when we look at it what we're seeing is more delay is is oftentimes desirable compared to the crash performance that we've been having and in the places where we have more delay we seem to be tolerating that reasonably well so you know we've we've put some thought into it and concluded that drivers just simply perceive delay differently which is you know partially why there is a different level of service for each of these so when you're sitting at a signal you pull up and you just miss it and you wait there for 
80 seconds. Well, that happens in a busy part of town and that's just the way it is and you don't really think twice about it, but you're just sitting still and you wait. Uh, this picture on the right is an all-way stop. This is, it actually happens to be Veerling, but it's just kind of a fun picture because there's so much delay there. But if you're sitting in this queue at a stop sign, that same, you know, minute and a half or whatever, whatever amount of time that I said is much more irritating to you going through a stop sign than it is when you're sitting at a traffic signal, you know, and the feeling that something needs to be done about it is even greater under these circumstances. So this is um, Highway 61, obviously, and this is uh, the southern roundabout at 97. So this is in Forest Lake. There's two roundabouts on this corridor right next to their high school, if you don't know the area. This queue here is a common queue, common enough that I could find it on Google. And this space that you see here and in the picture on the right is the space that was designed for, built and set aside for the second approach lane at this roundabout. So not only are drivers sitting in 70 plus second queues at this roundabout, but they're sitting right next to a second lane that would reduce those queues. Uh, we spoke with the area engineer in this area recently and have over time to discuss what are you seeing you know like what are you hearing about the performance of these roundabouts in this same county we've, we've spoken to joe gustafson who is the traffic engineer for washington county and he has some pretty strong opinions about delay and and some beliefs that you know people can tolerate just simply tolerate more delay and so we were trying to kind of verify what we were hearing from him and what we heard from our area engineer is that he has not received one single complaint about delay at this roundabout, not one. And so that has kind of left us with that and what we heard from Washington County and what we've seen at other places when we pile those things together, it's kind of left us, you know, with a general framework for what we consider to be a reasonable amount of delay. And and that's that's still a work in progress, but we have some ideas on it. And so in 2016, they did um, a research program, and I think it was, I don't know if it was the Highway Capacity Manual that did it specifically, but they went through and they looked at the volumes and delay on roundabouts all across the country, and they produced a new set of numbers of what they considered to be, you know, reasonable conflict numbers or maximum conflict numbers, depending on roundabout types. This is um, the geometrics website. So if you were to type in min.geometrics, you would come to this page. The second tab is resources, and that would be a reasonable way to get yourself to the facility design guide. So we recently produced um, a new version of this, and um, which it took us a long time to do it and a lot of hands in it, but but we've produced this guidance and our intention is that it would continue to evolve over time and that we would improve it. But at the moment, this is where we stand. And so these numbers that you're seeing here, so instead of the rule of thumb of a thousand vehicles in the peak hour, like I mentioned, or a thousand vehicles in conflict, like I mentioned earlier, the number we're looking at now is 1400 vehicles. And that's that's what came out of that out, out of that federal federal guidance. And the other part of it is your uh, gap acceptance in your headway numbers when you're modeling it. That, that information is here too, and that we just wanted to highlight it when once you start doing your modeling. But the but we look at it and we say, okay, now the feds are saying these are the types of conflict numbers that that we should be, you know, that we could see and that might potentially work much higher than what we used to say. So when we when we kind of combined all of those things and we say, okay, what are we what are we seeing for delay when we see that when we look at the federal numbers, what are we seeing for delay at some of our other roundabouts in our system that people seem to be tolerating it okay? And what we've kind of come to is a rule of thumb of the moment, and that's that's that we're looking at roughly seventy seconds. You know, I'd say give or take, but mostly give. And where that will go into the future, we're not sure, but we use that kind of as a as a you know a, a starting point for how much delay should we be be willing to tolerate. And once we take that starting point, we then say, okay, now to reduce that delay, what types of moves have to be added? You know, and if if they're the types of moves that would tend to cause crashes, 
well, then we would start to favor just accepting that delay. If they're the type of movements that are less likely to cause crashes, then we would be more likely to take action to reduce this delay, looking to avoid the crashes, looking to avoid um, maintenance trouble, looking to avoid a bigger roundabout or a more costly roundabout. But all of those things are being being weighed in when we're when we're looking at it. But the but this I, I think is is probably the primary reason that we were asked to speak today was to talk about that number, how we came to it, why we came to it, and what will happen with it in the future, which we we don't quite know yet, but we have been posing the question to the feds of might you do something to <laughs> come up with a way of of quantifying level of service for roundabouts, you know, that we could just use versus versus us having to each state individually deal with their own experience and try and come up with their own way. So that is the the first topic, which was roundabout um, capacity, I guess. And so I could pause here if, if someone had a, a comment or a question about anything that they've heard so far. Jim, Jim this is Casey. Casey. we've had a, a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Doug's been trying to respond to a lot of them. Um, someone had asked, um, apparently there are um, a few single lane roundabouts with conflicts over 1500 vehicles per hour in the system with no complaints. Do you have examples of some of those locations? Of over 1500 in our system? Yes. Who, who posed that one? I can't see the comments. I oh, put that uh, one up, Jamal. It's up at um, it's up at the area where they have We Fest every year, or used to have We Fest every year. Oh, up in Detroit Lakes. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, okay. that one. They actually did see quite a lot of delay under those circumstances, but but there was a difference in in you know a designer of that specific case might actually be in this room right now, but the. I don't I don't remember what the actual conflict numbers were, but but what they had to do before was keep a police officer in the intersection to direct traffic all the time. And you have lots of campers and, and vehicles of that type moving through for that country music festival. And the result of installing that roundabout was the police officer was no longer necessary. They didn't have accident trouble and they did, in fact, get the traffic tr through. You know, the people in, under those circumstances were expecting delay. They still got delay, but it worked in a, in a way that was tolerable and that the community is happy with. Okay. And then the other question was, if queues are extensive at a roundabout, a rolling queue turns into a standing queue? No? Uh, there is a point where where it would, but it doesn't it doesn't really work that way. And and the I, I guess the, the thing that that highlights it is we've we've seen pretty long queues, you know, distance wise, pretty long queues. And the clear time of those long of those long queues is is what we've seen has been actually quite fast. And I, and we think that that's that's part of of what makes it more tolerable to drivers is that the people at the front are kind of continually moving out of the way. So there's this, we're always inching forward. And then once a, a significant gap comes, everybody's kind of been moving and then suddenly they just all move in a rush. And so, you know, there's there's been locations like the one that I showed you in, in Woodbury there, the, like I sat and watched that one in the afternoon. You know, I actually just parked at the Jerry's and, and sat and watched the queues and saw, you know, six, 700 foot long queues forming behind that roundabout. And then 20 seconds later, it was empty. <laughs> so then then you wait a little bit and the signals change and another rush of traffic comes and it and it starts to pile up again and then suddenly it, it clears and you're and that's the I think that's the the type of rolling queue that is that is leading to that that type of driver perception. And you you see it the same thing up on 97 and 61. I didn't go see it, but um, I've had a I've had coworkers mention what happens and so on, on one side you've got traffic coming away from highway 35 and that's coming in platoons and it backs up 61 but then the platoon clears and 61 starts to go fast there's a you know the way that that traffic moves is is more tolerable to people than than sitting at a stop sign would be so Great, hopefully thanks. that's along the lines of what they're asking yes and that's what we've had so far. So if you want to carry on, that should be fine. 
Okay, so the next topic was, I won't, I won't keep going back to your email. Next topic was mini roundabouts. This is one that hopefully, uh oh, wait, can I see the chat? No, I thought I could, I can't. The next topic was um, mini roundabouts, and I think it was something related to mini roundabouts versus versus single lane roundabouts. So this, um, the picture on the left here was, you know, maybe this is from a report or from a presentation about a year or so ago. You know, there there are actually more many roundabouts now than than there are in this picture. You know, but it kind of gives you an idea that they that they are spreading. You know, and I guess defining features. You know, traditionally of a mini roundabout would be the overall size. You know, being you know something under a hundred foot ICD generally, uh, an entirely mountable central island, entirely mountable. Um, splitter islands on the approach, um, one phase crossing, you know, so not having not having refuge for pedestrians and just the ability to fit in a smaller footprint intersection, you know, so looking at where is it viable to fit in more urban environments because of its size um, and lack of impact to the uh, to the adjacent right of way. Um, being in a more low speed setting is the traditional, you know, approach to using them just because of the lack of approach geometry, the lack of visibility of the central island, that it's it's generally considered to be a low speed treatment. But the mini roundabouts in our system are sometimes used this way, but not always. And so, oh, that didn't advance it, how about that? Advance. So this is one that that people would, you know, many people would recognize. This is in Shakopee on Beerling in front of this school. And um, actually, the picture that you saw about queues in front of the stop sign where the cars were backed up all the way down the road was this road. And so they they went out and built this is still under construction, but they, they went out and built this, this roundabout and the ICD of this says it's a mini. The flat central island says that this is a mini. But the, the approach splitter islands are, you know, B curbs with approach geometry of a single lane roundabout. So then the question becomes, what is it? You know, is it a mini roundabout? Is it a single lane roundabout? And in our manual update that we went through recently, we kind of answered that question. And our answer was, doesn't matter. So we don't really care what, what you're going to call the thing. Our approach and the way we view it is that we want to apply um, features of the roundabout that fit the situation. So if you had a high speed approach, well then give that approach high speed geometry. If you had an approach coming out of a parking lot, well treat it like an approach coming out of the parking lot, you know, make it fit in the space that's available and, and really try and make it meet the needs of the situation and not try so hard to design one specific type of roundabout. You know, so there are there are limits to this. You know, we we acknowledge that we want you know, to some extent, we want to present drivers with something that that they're expecting. So, you know, we we don't want to have the have one style of design here, and then at the very next thing that they encounter, it's an entirely different side, type of design that might cause them to make mistakes. And so, we are conscious of that, but but shy of that, we just our opinion is that the features that best fit the situation are the ones that should be there, regardless of what the thing is called. You know, and this is a situation where a mini roundabout was actually used in staging. And, and I think that if I if I recall correctly, there's been two times that this has happened. But this this was one that was not only easy to find, but I actually managed to find um, aerial photos of it also in both conditions. And so we have a high speed approach on the east leg, a high speed approach on the south leg, crossing railroad tracks just prior to it low speed going into, oh shoot, what town is this? Is it Deerwood? I think it must be somewhere up, up near Crosby in the Cuyuna. Yes, that's Deerwood. This is that. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's Deerwood. <laughs> I have a hard time with names. So the this was installed, used as traffic control during a construction project and then removed after the fact. But 
they liked it so much that they're they've actually come back and they want to permanently close this road and install a single lane roundabout here and so they're not looking to put a mini in but they but it was so successful that it's actually caused them to reach out and want one so a case where a mini was used as a low cost staging solution you know which was kind of an, a neat thing that i thought you might find interesting now this is you know a compact urban which you'll recognize but it's not really so dissimilar from what you saw at Veerling. You've got splitter islands, high speed approaches on Highway 55 on both legs. It's sized the same as a single lane roundabout, but the, the entire central island is flattened to accommodate, you know, large vehicle haulers that are in the area and and turning movements without without making the roundabout a lot larger. This was done a while ago and it is actually kind of large and maybe not entirely like the way that we would do it right at this moment, but another example of a, of a roundabout that it's not really a single lane and it's not really a mini roundabout and it was just the best fit for the for that situation. Then we will go to our um, our favoriteest and most famous roundabouts our mini roundabouts, which would be St. James. So a pair of them were put in town and this is this is what um, was mentioned earlier about a project manager really working with with their, the local partners. 11 foot lanes, nine foot parking were used in town and the uh, traffic engineer in this district is now a favor of it, uh, a, a fan of that because of how well this has worked out. Many roundabouts and here's your back end diagonal parking. And I actually, how am I doing for time? We have about 15 minutes left. Okay, so I, maybe uh, maybe I'll just oh, did I click the thing? All right. So the question is, do we have sound? Can you hear it? I'm not hearing it. Oh shoot! Nope. All right. <laughs> so okay, stop presenting. Start presenting. Click the do my sound. And back up. How about now? Good. Yes. My name is Gary Sturm and Mayor of the City of St. James. I believe that the Mini Roundabouts was the best solution for efficiency, traffic flow, and usability for our community. Joseph McCabe, I'm the Executive Director of the St. James Area Chamber of Commerce. I was City Manager for the City of St. James for 10 years. I've had a number of people that have approached me and said, I was really opposed to the roundabouts. I like them. The traffic flow is better. It's safer. There's more positives than there are negatives. Sam Hansen, the city manager of St. James. Some of the feedback that we received was that they did not like the stoplight system as we had. They wanted either a four-way stop, flashing light, and that sort of generated the idea of what else can we do besides a semaphore intersection. To redo the stop signs and the signals, we would have to have cost us about $950,000 more, and we could save money by doing the roundabouts. With the many roundabouts, we could use whatever we had for streets and did not have to purchase anything other than a 12 feet from the west side of, of our boulevard, which the city owned. The advantage of going to a mini roundabout is that we can do it with the same footprint that we have already in place. Um, with a full-blown roundabout, we would have had to uh, take out a few of the buildings to make room for that, and that was not something that we wanted to do. We wanted to have the least amount of economic impact as we could through staff questions. A lot of the discussion that we had with our department heads really alleviated any concerns we had from a city management point of view. Brad Orvis, Fire Chief. When we first heard that we were going to be getting the roundabouts in town, uh, I had my reservations on them, you know, how we were going to be able to work with them as far as our emergency vehicles. and. I haven't seen any any hindrance as far as the trucks, our response time or maneuverability through them. So as far as any trucks not being able to get through, that was a concern when we were going through the whole planning process uh, from comments that we heard from truckers, but that has not shown as far as our traffic patterns. 
Um, I was going to stop it, but actually um, someone mentioned earlier about the back end diagonal parking. Do you want to play ahead and, and see that part too? Sure. All right, maybe I'll jump you forward here a little bit. The back angle parking was to get some of our parking stalls back that we were losing because of the many roundabouts. We wanted to get some of those back by turning what was previously parallel parking to back angle parking. I think that has gone over extremely well. It increases the safety because now people, when they go to shopping downtown and they're loading up their trunk, that's now on the sidewalk side instead of with their body over into traffic. And it's also uh, safer from a standpoint. You can see who's behind you when you're driving and backing into the stall. Um, and it's much safer because when you're, you're pulling out of a stall, you can see what's going on as you're pulling out into traffic. The advantages of back angle parking compared to parallel parking is um, you can, one, you can allow more people to park in a smaller area of space. Uh, two, it's safer. You can load up your car a lot easier and you can, the visibility coming, pulling back into traffic is a lot easier as well. Any other agencies that would, looking at the roundabout alternative, I would uh, have those communities be open-minded and come to our community and see how they actually work. Come to St. James, see what we have. Visit with some of the people in town. My advice, if you have any uh, hesitations on them, find communities that have them and just come and check them out. All right, let's see, I'll get rid of that. And so it, it's um, it's kind of an, an interesting thing overall, you know, but this I, I would say that it, it speaks a little bit to, to what I was talking about earlier, which is we really want our roundabouts to perform well because we don't want restrictions on where we're allowed to install them based on perceptions about them. You know, and we have other designs where that where that can be problematic and, you know, looking at a video like that that gives a pretty rave review that the that the locals are very happy with it that their trucking industry is is happy with the way it's operating for them that they feel like they they now have you know really no traffic delays anymore compared to what they had before that you know you'd think that every community around the area would look at that and say oh, magic bullet we love it we totally want it do that for us but i wouldn't say that 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 has entirely been the case but you know Oh, as time goes on and as, as they continue to spread, maybe maybe we'll see more of it. OK, now this is the one at the beginning that I mentioned that maybe a little, you know, user user interaction could could apply. So signing and striping was it was listed as as a topic. And, you know, what specifically we would talk about about the striping, I, I guess, was we weren't we weren't entirely sure. I guess one topic, you know, and, and the reason that that we chose this picture because the a, a part that's you know of interest to us in striping is in particular in multi-lane approaches this vein striping area and designing it so that it serves as off tracking for the left lane and also off tracking for the right lane, you know, so that we can really try and use it to control the size of the entries, control the length of the pedestrian crossings, and uh, <clears throat> and just you know try and come up with an efficient design that doesn't result in path overlap in the entry to the roundabout. So there were different ways of handling this. MnDOT did a study, and I, I thought I saw Mark Lenters on the the list here at, at one point when he popped into the room, but I don't know if he's still here. But Minnesota and Wisconsin did a did a research study together looking at roundabout entries and how they operate. And so they had one case where they allowed, you know, overlap to happen anywhere in the roundabout, you know, so whether it be in the entry circulating or exiting that a vehicle, a large vehicle in one lane would tend to over track and encroach on the vehicle in the adjacent lane. The the third option for it of three was to just simply add additional space so that they never off track into each other's lanes. So just have wider circulatory road, wider exit along with wider entrance. 
and in between the two was that the second option, which is the one that that Minnesota, you know, that that MnDOT has to a great extent, not even to a great extent. We've just simply adopted it as our, our way of doing it is not allow overlap in the entry, but allow some tracking over within the circulatory road and on the exit. We don't do it extensively. You know, we do put tangents into the entries and tangents into our exits on purpose. And we have, you know, we have, and I can't quite come up with a good word for it. We call them tangential exits, but we have flattened the exit path so that we, we don't control the R3 speed, the, ex, the exiting speed as much as we used to, to make them more drivable. And the combination of those things has resulted in not having, you know, intolerable levels of overlap, if if any at all. But but we don't intentionally widen to stop that from happening. It's more more of a side effect. So I don't know if if anyone has striping related questions. And and I wouldn't say that striping is is really a specialty area for us. We have a group that does that, but we can we can try and answer if you have them. So. Is there a? I think I see the the comments actually. So did, Tom Fiddler had a question about case three truck accommodations. Yep. And yep. Does MnDOT have any? You know, I don't. I, I guess there's other MnDOT staff on the line, but in the time that I, I've worked here over the last ten years, we have never designed intentionally for case three. There there were times where it was suggested, but we've never actually actually done it. And the, the result of the research that was done on the topic and what you'd find in that facility design guide, there is some discussion on that on that research. And for reasons that weren't explained, there was actually a crash increase that they found when case three was done. So I'm not sure if that's related to just simply faster entry speeds or what the reason for it was, but there actually appeared to be you know, drawbacks to providing that additional width, you know, beyond just cost, but actually actually in function. Uh, let's see, Gene Russell, does Minnesota have any laws for not driving alongside a truck in a roundabout? We do not. Wisconsin has um, effectively told the drivers straddle, straddle both lanes all the way through the roundabout and don't let anyone next to you. And if a truck were to do that, you know, no one's going to stop them. But um, I, I would say that there is a tendency for people to to stagger even when it's cars. If you watch the way way multi lane operate is that even cars don't tend to drive directly side by side through multi lane roundabouts and people tend to shy from trucks. Our, our view on it was when they pull up and they stop and they're prepared to accept a gap don't let them run into each other. Once you start, if this truck were to off track into this lane, a vehicle in this lane could shy onto the truck apron if they needed to to get out of the way. And a truck on the inside obviously would just use the truck apron and then we wouldn't have that conflict point. So I guess the answer is no, we don't have a specific law about it, but we haven't had functional troubles to to warrant us doing something about it either. And if if truck drivers primarily work in Wisconsin and they happen to drive that way in Minnesota. We haven't seen any problems related to that either. So I guess I'll go on. So I didn't have a lot of slides related to these to the topics of striping and signing. So what I did is I grabbed this is a, a shot out of the out of the traffic engineering manual showing um, signing, you know, and just an example of signing on a, on a roundabout approach. is that nothing Jim, I'll just letting you know we have about five minutes, minutes, left. Five minutes left oh then you know what i will skim by this i guess the only thing i really want to say about this is that in multi lanes um particularly if a lane is going to drop as a turn lane or, or something that would be unexpected that overhead signing is something that may be called for in the designs so something to, to be aware of um i'll jump ahead then um you, I, I, I don't think I entirely followed the the script, but you talked about roundabout landscaping in in the questions a little bit, and so we kind of put this under the the list of don'ts. So, do we have specific rules that you're not allowed to put anything in central? We don't, 
but it's something that we we actively discourage. We don't like to put things there that could be hit if there's a high speed approach, particularly. Um, you know, like I can think of a place that has some walls that were not designed that way, but ended up installed that way that we don't that it wasn't what we were looking for. But in general, we discourage it. Uh, the district traffic engineers actually seem to be flat against it. So it's not something that comes to our office very often because that MnDOT just realistically isn't allowing things to be in this space. But we don't want anything out there that would attract pedestrians, for example. You know, this one is, I don't know if people on the call happen to know Alman Ramich. He's a, um, you know, he works in traffic for MnDOT and he's from Bosnia. And so this is his hometown. And this thing lights up at night and cars park in here and people go and stand here and they take pictures and they hang out in this space. We specifically do not want people in our roundabouts. <laughs> so that's an example of don't do that. Um, approach geometry. This is Medford. Medford has had crash trouble and you know, we've kind of done this before. If you if you get in street view and you start walking your way up the ramp and you know, of course you can see McDonald's, but you you know, the question you have to ask is when do you see that there's a roundabout in front of you? Like when do you actually see the central island of the roundabout, which is over here? You know, it's never in front of it's never in front of the road. And this, you know, aligning your approach geometry this way, um, locating the central island out of the intersection because you because you want to make staging easier and resulting in the approach roadway not pointing at the roundabout. That is not something that we favor. Um, don't crest curve uh, in a different view. The uh, the skid marks start right at the point where the person approaching this this roundabout suddenly could see the central island. The, the vertical curve shielded it. They couldn't see it coming. Um, an extreme example and not on our system, but the type of thing that we try and avoid. This curb is on a uh, on the truck apron. I think this might be Aitken. And the reason this happened was because there was a detour that that sent um, OSFW vehicles down this corridor that wouldn't normally be there. But the point being, you know, identify the vehicles that that would be using your corridor and design for them, you know, to you know, avoid this type of thing happening. Like we, we don't want to not accommodate a vehicle that uses it and then deal with the maintenance trouble that would come from it. Um, site distance on approaches. So we want landscaping to limit site distance in places where drivers don't need it and potentially shouldn't have it. But here's an example of the approaching roadway. Can't really see traffic approaching on the other roadway and the minor road has the dominant traffic. So there's more traffic here than there than there are coming off of the highway ramp. These people do not yield to the people that were that are coming off the highway ramp. Or actually, I, I totally reversed it. I'm sorry. They can't see them coming. These people simply cut off the people that are already in the roundabout. I, I totally said it backwards. Um, a project ended up happening, as you can see on the bottom, where where they actually cut this slope back and paved it. So that to improve the sight line, it hasn't repaired it to standard, but it but it's improved it. Uh, another don't, and this this goes back to what I was talking about before, and. Uh, pushing the roundabout out of the intersection for staging, resulting in uh, work off of the approach roadway. You know that this is this is an example where we worked with with the designer and the, and the district and came up with, you know, a design that that we really think was a was a good improvement. But we've seen this in a few cases recently with with designers who take the time to really try out different alternatives and, and come up with ways to make the design work even when the approaches are skewed or are there are other things working against them and, and really coming up with designs that kind of fit the situation well and you know reduce the amount of, of approach work and, and overall cost of the project. So this one we thought really turned out well. <clears throat> this one is kind of interesting and if you if you know whose it is don't say so but the it, it just had a couple of features in it that that fall heavily in the don't category. One of them being you know putting in a free right that has no no physical separation from the from the, the through traffic. This is a this this would qualify in our opinion as failure. Like like specifically don't do this. A yielding right, single lane, introduce the second lane, or physically separate it all the way around the corner. Either of those things we would do. This we would never do. This was a an interesting one in that if you if you did the path of the vehicle entering and where they would drive 
the through movement, they actually pinch the space that's available for the turning movement. So this this was another thing that fell on the don't list. I don't know if anyone's asking questions. I'm, I'm racing along now. Yeah, just, yeah, uh, just hang on for a second. For a those second, of you who are able to hang on, please do so. And those who have to have off, 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 will actually be we'll posting these post to the video to YouTube. YouTube, 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 YouTube so, so don't feel like you're missing out on, on a lot. You can always go back and take a look at questions okay. asked. Yeah, did you want to cover this one, Doug? We're kind of over time. This is uh, one of the don'ts that um, that we pay particular attention to. This is an example of a, an approach profile when where it comes into the roundabout profile. And you can see uh, they they label the tie in at the roundabout and they give you an elevation and they label the tie in at the circulatory road and give you an elevation. But you notice there's a there's a bust there. And this is more, you know, just think things through and be very cognizant of what you're submitting to us. If, if Jamal goes to the next slide, and we've got this detailed in Chapter 60 in the FDG, we would prefer that you give us the tie-in station and elevation both on the approach roadway and on the roundabout profile. One, to make it easier for us, but also our thinking is that if you go to this much effort, you're likely to catch busts. And we pay particular attention to this because this can have, um, this can have large, correcting problems like this can end up having large impacts on your schedule, which is always something that's in the front of our minds. I would like to say, Casey, this was probably my fault. I, I was under the impression that we were speaking for an hour and, and kind of planned for that amount of time. So I, I might have goofed us up a little bit. I no guess. Worries. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Last slide is um, was related to, you know, coming up with with creative ways to accommodate the things that you must accommodate, but keeping in the forefront of your mind the primary user. So we don't want the the uh, the design to do something severe to accommodate a vehicle that hardly ever goes there that would make the function of the roundabout less ideal for your primary users that use it every day so coming up with ways to accommodate these other things within a footprint that would still be desirable for the primary users is is something that we try and see so this is two tractors hauling a crusher through chisholm which happens you know once or twice a year i think and this is a real picture of that roundabout that makes it look relatively normal. So that was the normal presentation with uh, the, the fast running at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both. Um, I think Doug's been doing a great job of responding to questions in the chat. Um, there was one about just uh, any do's or lessons learned about staging and then just a question about RRFBs. Sounds like um, there might be one case study in Winona that's implementing RRFBs but not really implemented elsewhere. Um, and then for staging, um, Doug said, take your time, think things through, don't sacrifice long-term performance for short-term staging goals. Yeah, the, uh, yes, it's the, you know, making permanent changes to solve temporary problems we're, we're not always the biggest fan of when it can be avoided. In RFBs, there was a time where it, it was kind of a don't do that. And now we do see that as a recommendation whenever pets are going to be crossing multiple lanes that, that we are receiving that, that uh, as a comment lately. And okay. whether or not we, whether or not RFBs end up in as solutions is, would really be led by the bike and ped group. We have a member of bike and ped on our roundabout review team. We we'll, we always um, defer to them for the for uh, for elements that are strictly not geometric. Um, so if that if you start to see that, it's because it was brought on by bike and ped and not necessarily by us in geometrics, but we are we kind of were, we're their voice. People tend to listen to us more than they listen to bike and ped, sadly. <laughs> All right. Well, I wanna thank Jamal and Doug both for pulling up together this great presentation today and also for their time in, in providing us the presentation. Um, as mentioned, we will be posting this to our YouTube channel, so keep an eye out for that. And thank you all for attending today. We look forward to seeing you at future virtual and hopefully in-person events someday. Thank, thank you, you both. Great job.